and welcome to episode 108 of Killer Hangover. My name is Beth. And I'm Bettina. And this week, we will be telling you true crime and paranormal stories from the state of North Carolina. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. You've got the true crime. And mom has the paranormal story and the beverage. What are we drinking this week? So... (laughs) I did not really look up a cocktail specifically from North Carolina. I have a cocktail that goes with my story, my paranormal. Is that what we're doing now? (laughs) Well, you know, we've hit all the states like a couple of times, so I don't know. (laughs) I think this is kind of a fun idea. I don't know. Well, I was looking for, I went to the liquor store and I was looking for a hot damn, but then I got Fireball instead. Then I actually found a site, cocktails.lovetoknow.com. And it is actually all about Fireball cocktails. So was there a reason why you went to go look for Hot Damn? Uh-huh. Why? Oh, for your story. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay, so we're like off branding it to Fireball, which is a brand. So that's kind of funny. I, I read that Fireball is actually like a step up. So, oh, oh, look but at I you. like, but I like the design on the design on the bottle goes better with my story anyway. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm I'm white knuckling it here, Mom. Okay, I'm holding on. Let's go. <laughs> All right, my drink is the orange cinnamon old fashioned. It's an old fashioned with a fireball twist. Got it. It's one sugar cube, three dashes of orange bitters a splash of soda water, a half an ounce of fireball whiskey, one and a half ounces of bourbon, ice, and orange peel for garnish. That didn't happen. (laughs) In a glass, you muddle the sugar cube, bitters, and a splash of soda water. And then you add the ice, fireball, and bourbon, stir it all up, then you drink it. (laughs) (laughs) But I have to say, it's a little sweet for me. So the next time I make it, I think I'm going to actually leave out the sugar altogether. That's interesting. I was actually thinking about that because Fireball is pretty sweet. It is sweet. Anyway, it is. I a, think. It's, it's very sweet. And then with the with the cube, it it's very sweet. So I would leave that out. Okay. And I did add more than a splash of soda water because personally I like soda water. So I put my a healthy splash into it. I can barely taste the bubbles, I guess, or feel the bubbles. Anyway, that's how I made this drink. And I am enjoying it. (laughs) With the patina touch, always changing it up. (laughs) Yep. And I had to wait for you for a while to get on because of boo boo. So I had half of it already. (laughs) (laughs) So not only are we not drinking together because of virtual recording, We've also not been able to enjoy the actual beverage on the show because of my dang kids. <laughs> okay, well, sit back, enjoy your cocktail, beverage of choice, whatever you are all drinking, and I am going to share with you a true crime story. Now, most of us are familiar with the horrible murders of pregnant Colette, six-year-old Kimberly, and three-year-old Kristen McDonald in Fort Bragg in 1970. Mom shared that story back in episode three, Jeffrey McDonald. Although he tried to stage it that was some Manson-loving hippies that killed his family, he got caught and was arrested for their murders. Now, I bring up the McDonald's because I'm going to share another family murder that happened in Fort Bragg. And I didn't want you all to think, gosh, Beth, are you that low on sleep? Have you been drinking that much that you're retelling a story? (laughs) We've already heard this. (laughs) Although it is a mother and her two daughters that were killed in Fort Bragg, this story takes place 15 years after the McDonald's case. Mm. And it is very different. No hippies, for starters. Well, there weren't any hippies in the other one either. (laughs) (laughs) Touche. And even though it will take 25 years, justice was served. So first and foremost, I am going to introduce you, the best I can, to the sweet souls, the Eastburns. Notice I said the best I can. 
because unfortunately, this case has become all about the killer, all about the details of the case and the trials and the victims and their stories have been lost in the shuffle. Ugh. If you do want more detail and more about the Eastburn family in particular, please check out the book Innocent Victims, The True Story of the Eastburn Family Murders by Scott Wisnand. The book goes into significant depth on the Eastburns and who they were. There is also a documentary that I watched. It was uh, 2020 Witness. It's on YouTube. But to be honest, like the documentary is made really to entertain you Mm. and doesn't go into much depth. You get way more information in the book. Of course. Yeah. In most cases, that's probably true. Yes. Okay. So the Eastburn family. Gary Eastburn was captivated by Katie the moment he saw her. It was love at first sight, Gary said on the 2020 episode. The two got married in 1975, and Gary joined the Air Force. Eleven years later, Gary worked as Chief of Air Traffic Control at Pope Air Force Base next to Fort Bragg, and by this point, he and Katie had three daughters, five-year-old Kara, three-year-old Aaron, and Jana, who was just under two. They lived on Summerhill Road in a quaint little house in Fort Bragg. Katie was described as a very devoted mother. Growing up, she was described as a straight arrow, never getting into trouble. She was a loving wife and mother. As mom knows, she was a military wife in another lifetime. (laughs) But while the husband was on duty somewhere, military wives are obviously working from home, running the household and taking care of everything while the husbands are away. Right. Yes. Or vice versa if the wife is in the military. Right. Yes, exactly. And Katie did a great job at that. Now, in 1985, it was springtime and the family was in the process. Uh, They had just gotten orders to the UK. And you know how the military works. They say move and you say, yes, sir. I thought that was going to come out funnier. That didn't. (laughs) Anyway, they say move and you say yes. Anyway, you get it. They were stationed, I think, right outside of London. But first, Gary had some training, a three-month training course he was going to do in Alabama. And while Gary was away at his training in Alabama, Katie took care of everything on the home front, her normal duties, as well as preparing for the move. Mm. One of those things was adopting out their family dog, Dixie. Oh. I can't imagine that was very easy to do, but there was a very long quarantine at the Mm -hmm. time for Mm -hmm. dogs to have to travel overseas, and it was just going to be too difficult for them, so they were going to sell... Dixie. Now, like I said, this was 1985. There's no texting or anything like that. And the couple kept in touch with letters and a weekly phone call every Thursday night. As I'm sure you're guessing, you knew we were heading here. On Thursday, May 9th, when Gary made his weekly call to his girls, there was no answer. Mm. Right away, he is pretty frantic. He calls the next day and night when he can with no no answer. answer. Some resources stated that Gary called a friend in the area to call the police station to have the house checked on. Mm -hmm. Some resources didn't claim that. But the resources that claimed he had a friend or a police officer go and check on the home said that they found nothing of concern at the Eastbourne house. By Sunday, Mother's Day. Oh, my God. Mother's Day is coming up this coming Sunday. That's really weird. That just kind of hit me as I was reading this. Oh, by Sunday, Mother's Day, he's not the only one suspicious of the girls and their whereabouts. The Eastburn's neighbors are also a bit suspicious as to why they hadn't seen Katie and the girls in a few days. The family's car was parked in the driveway and hadn't moved. Now, Katie had mentioned she may go and make a trip to visit Gary, so maybe they took the bus. But the newspapers were also piling up on the front porch. Something was off. So the neighbor went over to check things out. He rings the doorbell and hears nothing. No squeals from the three little girls. No pitter-patter of little feet running to the door. Nothing. But then, very faintly, he hears what sounds like the baby crying. He rushes home and gets his wife. They call the police as well as the family babysitter to see if she knew anything. In time, they are all gathered around the outside of the Eastburn house. 
and it's very clear that they are all hearing the 22-month-old baby Jana crying from inside. Oh, jeez. Now, apparently, because of protocol, they couldn't just barge right in. But the babysitter is like, oh, my God, I see her. I see her. She is absolutely distraught. We need to get into the house now. The police say, screw it, and they get into the house. The moment they enter the home, they smell it. Oh. Decomp. Baby Jana is brought to the neighbor who described her on the 2020 episode as gaunt. Her teeth were blackened. She was dehydrated, hungry, and just absolutely distraught. She is rushed to the hospital, where later doctors will tell them that baby Jana was hours from death. (gasps) Back in the home, investigators start their search. The attack looked to have started in the living room. There they found things tossed around and a pair of women's underwear that looked to have been cut off. The trail led to the back master bedroom, where they discovered three-year-old Erin first. She's laying on the floor of the master bedroom, a pillow covering her head. Her throat had been slit, so much so she had almost been decapitated. On the other side of the bed, on the floor, was Katie. Her bra and her blouse were pulled apart and up over her head. Her neck had been cut, but she had also had multiple stab wounds to her chest. Some resources said 14. Oh, jeez. Next, investigators found five-year-old Kara. I'm sorry. Um, This one was hard for me. She was found with multiple stab wounds to her chest as well. And she was also found in her bed under a Star Wars blanket. Ugh. She had gone to her room and hid under her blanket, like all kids do, for safety. I'm sorry. This one was really hard for me. Okay. Police call Gary, and according to the 2020 episode, when he answered the phone, his first response was, quote, how many of them are dead? Unquote. Oh. They didn't share anything with him over the phone. He flew home and received the news in person. Now, in the investigation, police found that the house had been cleaned. For the way... And the murders occurred. There was not a lot of blood on the scene. They used luminol and the whole house lit up. Oh. Doorknobs, light switches, floors, walls, even footprints were found inside the home when they lit it up with luminol. There was also physical evidence found on the scene as well. Fingerprints, some boot prints outside the home. I guess on a towel, there was some blood found that did not match the blood of any of the victims. There was some DNA under Katie and one of the girl's fingernails. There was also three hairs, a head hair on Kara's chest, one head hair in the master bedroom, and a pubic hair in the living room where the attack had started. And the last piece of physical evidence was from the rape kit done on Katie, where they found semen inside of her. There was a lot of physical evidence, but there was also some witnesses that came forward. One main witness was 20-year-old Patrick Cohn. Now, Patrick had a bit of a reputation. He had been arrested a time or two, but his gut instinct was to come forward. And I just want you to keep that in mind because a lot of criminals, no matter if they had anything to do with the case or not, a lot of them are not going to want to come forward and go speak to the police willingly. Mm -hmm. And he did because in his gut, he knew something was wrong. And so he came forward and he said that around 3 a.m. He saw a man leaving the Eastburn's home. He was a tall white man in a knitted cap or a beanie. He had on jeans and a members only jacket. He had blonde hair. He had like flared kind of nostrils and a mustache. He was carrying a trash bag. The two crossed paths. And the man said something along the lines of, I'm getting an early start today, to Patrick. The man then proceeded to walk to his white Chevette. He got in and left. With this information, police make a sketch and get it out to the public ASAP. We have a witness. We have physical evidence. Now we need the motivation. There were items taken from the home. A metal lockbox, $300 in cash, and Katie's ATM card. The police get a hit when they see that the ATM card was used. After doing some investigating, they find who used the ATM after Katie's card was used. 
And the woman they interview basically gives them the same description as Patrick. Wow. So now we have the killer use the ATM as well, potentially. Right. So was this just for money? Was it a sexual assault? But then why were the young girls killed? Yeah. Witnesses. Did they witness too much? Mm -hmm. Maybe that even explains why baby Jana was not killed. She would have been too young to necessarily be a witness. Jana was interviewed on the 2020 episode and she was, she has severe survivor's guilt. There are so many what ifs and whys that run through her head. Oh, that poor child. Ugh. Right after the murders, like I said, she was 21, 22 months, depending on the resources, mm -hmm. when it all happened. So she's just about two years old. After she was nourished and brought back to health, investigators even turned to baby Jana for some possible answers, maybe motive or an idea as to what happened. Mm -hmm. They brought in a child psychologist, and there are videos of this engagement, and it's, it was really hard to watch. But they show her a photo of her mom mm -hmm. and she starts to like gently stroke her mommy in the picture and she kisses the photo and she says, I mama at work and she's like kissing the photo. It's really hard to see. And then they show her a photo inside the family home and Jana shows fear. At one point, she even goes and hides under a chair in the room and she tells the doctor Hide, hide, bad guy, hide. <gasps> Which led investigators to believe that the older sisters had told their baby sister to go and hide at some point when the man was in the home. Now, the babysitter shared two interesting things with the investigators as well. One was that weeks leading up to the murders, Katie had said that someone had been stalking her and had oh. been calling her. They sometimes they would say nothing on the other end and sometimes they would say something of a more sexual nature. Mm -hmm. And this is in the 80s. You can't trace these phone calls. The other thing was now remember Katie was trying to find somebody to purchase Dixie. Yes. She had placed an ad in the newspaper and sometimes the babysitter would take messages from people calling about the ad. The babysitter remember just days before the murder taking down a note from a woman named Angela. Now, that note about Angela calling about the dog, as well as the dog, were not there when the murders happened. So the investigators kind of assumed that, obviously, this Angela woman was the one that got the dog. Okay. So Angela could have potentially been the last one to see Katie alive. Maybe she knew something. Maybe she saw something. So now they have out to the public the sketch as well as the request for an Angela or for anybody that may have purchased Dixie. Dixie, the family dog. Shortly after doing this, a young woman, Angela Hennis, was just about to sit down for dinner with her husband, Tim, and their two-month-old baby girl. When the news showed the sketch and asked for the person to come forward, she looks at her husband, she looks at her new dog, oh, no. and she says, we need to go to the police station ASAP. Oh, no. <laughs> The couple checks into the station and they take a seat in the waiting room. The lead investigator in the Eastburn case is walking in, minding his own business, honestly, probably in his head about this case or that. Sure. I honestly, like, I, I don't know how y'all investigators even get dressed in the morning. Like, me as a mom, my head is here and there and everywhere. Can you imagine if you're working multiple cases? Like, No, no. Uh, how do you turn it off to remember to brush your teeth before bed? Like, there's just... I can't and how even do you imagine. keep them separated? You know, how do you keep all I that know. information in your mind and keep the cases separated? I have no idea. It has to take some certain person because I know I couldn't do it. It would all, I don't know if it's my ADD or what, but I'd be doing one thing to another to another. I, I don't even think I'd ever eat. <laughs> well, and as compulsive as I am, I just try to get everything done and, and be so frustrated because I couldn't do it all in one day, you know, whatever. <sighs> So he's walking in and he stops cold in his tracks. There sitting in the station's waiting room is the living, breathing man in his sketch. <gasps> when he finds out that he is there for the Eastburn case, he's very intrigued. Could the killer seriously be turning himself in? Like, what is going on? They bring Tim Hennis in for questioning. And Tim is terrified. He's like, what the heck is going on? 
Oh, I just came in here to support my wife. <laughs> Do I need a lawyer? Like, I just came in to say that I bought this dog and you're showing my this picture of me all over. Like, I just bought this dog. <laughs> Jeez. The police are like, no, 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 no. You don't need a lawyer. You're fine. We just have a few questions. They questioned him for seven hours. That's just a few questions. Yes. He's very forthcoming and he's adamant. He has no idea what's going on. He just got a dog. He even leaves samples, fingerprints, his hair. I mean, as much as samples you can leave back in 1985. After the interview, police escort Tim, his wife, and their baby back to their white Chevette. Oh, no. In the police parking lot. Pick up on that? Yes. Same kind of car that Patrick right. saw the man driving. So another thing the police did while Tim was in there being questioned for seven hours was they had a photo of him and they put it in a photo lineup and they asked Patrick Cohn and the ATM lady and both picked out the photo of Tim Hennis as being the man that they saw. Oh, jeez. That night, Tim Hennis is arrested and taken in for sexual assault and three murders. Holy smokes. So now they have Army Sergeant Tim Hennis in custody and they start building their case. They had the ATM card lady. They had Patrick. What else? Well, apparently neighbors saw Tim Hennis burning something in a barrel in his backyard around the time of the murders. And wouldn't you know it? Tim's members only jacket was brought into the cleaners that Monday after Mother's Day. Oh, and Tim had been behind on his rent that month. $350 behind on his rent. Oh, my God. And how much money was taken from the Eastburn home? $300. And soon after the murders, he paid his rent in cash. One of the detectives claimed on the 2020 episode, quote, follow the evidence and around every corner is Tim Hennis, unquote. But besides these quote-unquote witnesses and odd occurrences, what else did they have? From all accounts, Tim was a family man. There had been no history of violence, and he had had a new baby girl only a year or so older than baby Jana. This was just not his character. And heck, he went into the police station himself. But the other thing that didn't look so hot for Tim was his alibi. He had driven his daughter and his wife to visit family on the night of the murder. But the thing was, is that he dropped them off and then he went home alone. The prosecution will later find that he did go and search out an old girlfriend for sex that night. Mm. But besides that, there was nothing. So he isn't the angel. So you can prove he had (laughs) extramarital sex, but that doesn't mean he's a killer. Yeah, no, that doesn't. No, things are piling up. Should I state that differently? Circumstantial evidence was piling up. So now, what about the physical evidence? The fingerprints found didn't match. Mm -hmm. The boot prints and footprints didn't match. Mm -hmm. The small blood sample didn't match. The hairs didn't match. None of the physical evidence that they had. And remember, it's 1985. Didn't match or inconclusive. It's not as... The testing was not as precise as it is now. Right. But they were either not a match or inconclusive. And the boot prints, I mean, the boot prints that were found outside, they were three sizes smaller than Tim's. Oh, geez. So besides circumstantial evidence and the fact that he was having extramarital affairs, that's it. Mm -hmm. A year later, they go to trial. Everything we just talked about is presented. A slideshow of photos of the crime scene and autopsies is shown to the jury. And it showed how just gruesome this case was. And on July 4th, four days into the trial, Tim Hennis was declared guilty and sentenced to death. Oh, my gosh. Really? Prosecution stated that after his ex-girlfriend turned him down. This is so the prosecution's story was that after his ex-girlfriend turned him down for sex, he went back to that pretty lady's house where he had adopted a dog a few days prior and made an attempt at sex there. Things went wrong and he killed her. The young girls had been witnesses, so he killed them as well. That's what prosecution claimed. Right. Tim Hennis sat on death row. The case is closed and Tim Hennis gets a postcard. 
Quote, Dear Mr. Hennis, I did the crime. I murdered the Eastburns. Sorry, you're doing the time. I'll be safely out of North Carolina when you read this. Thanks, Mr. X. Unquote. Did they have the wrong guy? I hope they ran that to the lawyers. Hennis meets with his wife and daughter through plexiglass as regularly as they can. I'm surprised the wife is staying by his side, but... And she did through all of it. Jeez. And he awaits his appeal. He sits on death row for two years while his lawyers worked on a new trial for him. I mean, nothing matched. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Eventually, the Supreme Court grants the appeal and overturns the guilty verdict. Oh, good. Claiming that, yes, it was all circumstantial evidence and that slideshow I mentioned with all the photos. Yeah, I guess it was like well over 45 minutes of photos. And this could kind of prompt any jury to want to blame somebody for this or. Of course. And the most gruesome photos. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And I guess the prompter was like right over Tim's head. So you're seeing all this stuff and then you're seeing Tim right below it. So you kind of start to connect it all after 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. The Supreme Court saw it was not a fair trial. So four years after the murders in 1989, Tim Hennis was granted a new trial. This trial was a bit different for the defense and the fact that Tim actually took the witness stand this time, swearing that he did not do any of this. I guess they also found a young kid, blonde hair, kind of matched the description of the sketch, who liked to take walks at night when he couldn't sleep. And when he did so, he wore a beanie and a members only jacket. Oh, Everybody wore a members only jacket back in those days. Your father had one. I mean, everybody wore. Everybody did. Yes, that was the thing. Uh, The ATM lady, well, apparently she went to the ATM three minutes after Katie's ATM card was used. And the defense had an interesting tactic. They made the jury sit in silence for three minutes to prove their point. Three minutes. That's plenty of time for somebody to get their card, leisurely walk back to their car, buckle their seatbelt and leave before the next person, this lady, went to use the ATM. And Mm -hmm. oh, by the way, the sketch was already circling the media by this point. Oh, it was. It was. I was going to ask. Okay. Okay. And the members only jacket mom already mentioned it was a very popular thing, but Yes, it was taken to the cleaners to be cleaned. So I guess there is a certain cleaner that specifically is used on blood or severe stains that the cleaners will use. Cleaners have. Mm -hmm. And they did this test. the The defense did this test to show that even on a jacket with blood, with this special product used, when luminol shines on it, blood is still basically shown. Okay. Okay. Now, this special product was not used on Tim's members only jacket. Uh, and when luminol shined on it, there was still no, no blood. blood. Okay. And the burn barrel that his neighbors, I guess, saw, mm-hmm. they checked the charred residue and checked all the stuff that was left and they didn't find anything linked to the case. Man, this guy had just really bad timing on everything. <laughs> the defense drove home that none of the physical evidence matched with Tim, and everything in the first trial had been circumstantial evidence. And the jury agreed. In April 1989, the jury found Hennis innocent on triple murder charges. For the first time in four years, Tim Hennis held his now toddler daughter as a free man. The Hennis family wept for joy as the Eastburns wept with sadness and grief. Mm. What did this mean for Katie, Aaron, Kara, If not Tim Hennis, their killer was out there, a free man. Tim Hennis went back into the military once he was released. He and his wife, who had stood by his side through everything, amazing, went on to have a second child. They were very vocal over time about how the justice system did them wrong and how Tim had lost years of his life on death row. He served in Desert Storm, the war in Somalia, And the book I mentioned before, Innocent Victims, was written and a movie was made on the book, all showing how the justice system failed for Tim. 
When asked on the 2020 episode if the lead detective in the Eastburn case had read the book, his response was, quote, I don't read fiction, unquote. Oh. And for the Eastburns, well, their killer was walking free. And the case sat cold in a box on a shelf in the cold case unit. Until 2005, when Detective Trotter noticed the very large box and decided to look into the case. A lot had happened in the world of DNA in the last 20 years. What about that rape kit and the semen sample they had from that? Right. It is finally able to be tested. And afterwards, the lead detective on the case calls Gary Eastburn. The detective on the line asked Gary, quote, Are you sitting down? Take a seat. Take a deep seat, unquote. It's Tim. The DNA found in the semen was a 1 in 12,000 trillion hit as belonging to Tim Hennis. It was 1.2 quadrillion times belonging to him than any other man. Holy smokes. So what now? We've all heard the phrase double jeopardy. Basically, you cannot be charged for the same crime twice. In civil court... There's the loophole. You cannot be charged twice for the same crime in civil court. Meaning, they forced Tim out of retirement and back into the army and officially charged him and took him to military court. Oh, well, it did happen on a military base. He is a military man. He's in the military. She was married to a military guy. I mean, now it wasn't. Just that easy. Apparently, the lab that did the testing was under some pretty tough scrutiny at the time. I guess they had changed results in other cases for prosecution. Uh. and the, So the defense for Tim were very quick to point this out. So the semen was sent to another lab where they ran the tests and <laughs> it was still a match. Mm-hmm. Before I go into the trial, I have to mention something I thought was so bizarre. So baby Jana and Gary, they followed the orders and they still moved out to the UK after the murders. Oh. There, Gary remarried a nurse out in London when I believe Jana was like eight years old. Fast forward to when Jana's older in the 2000s and she and her dad and her new mom, who she basically considers her mom, moved back to the States and they wanted to be as far away from North Carolina as possible, I think. So they settled in the Seattle area. Here's the bizarre thing. When Tim was arrested eventually in 2005, he was arrested at his home just outside of the Seattle area as well. Oh, so were they both stationed at Fort Lewis then or? They're retired. They are out of the military. Oh, man. They were all there by choice. (laughs) He was living 30 minutes away from Jana and her boyfriend. Uh, They were interviewed on the 2020 episode, and she was absolutely terrified of this man. Obviously, she has survivor's guilt, but she's also scared and she would have nightmares that this man was going to come back and finish the job. I mean, she really, Mm -hmm. this really stuck with her. I mean, obviously. So she's very haunted by this, and that was her biggest fear. But her boyfriend always reassured her, you know, she's safe. She's away from North Carolina nobody's going to be out here. You're okay. So when they found out that he was living only 30 minutes away from them. (sighs) Yeah. I mean, that's just crazy to me. Okay. So the prosecution now have the smoking gun, the matching DNA in the rape kit. Tim was offered a plea deal, but nope. They went to a third full trial. Defense. Now they state now that Katie Eastburn and Tim had consensual sex. Uh But originally, he had claimed that had never happened, that literally the only interaction the two ever had was when he met to get the dog. So now they had had sex. He claimed that he kept that from the original trial to not hurt Gary Eastburn any more than he was already hurting. (sighs) Sure. So the defense is sharing this point that Tim and Katie had had consensual sex. But he goes a step further. He does it in a matter of, well, you know how the military is, and the men are sent away a lot, off to war, off to work. 
And it's really common for the wives left at home to get lonely and have extramarital affairs. Um, Basically blaming her. Know your audience, dude. You are speaking to a jury of military men and women in military <laughs> court. Basically saying that they're all out there having sex all the time, cheating on their wives. <laughs> After having his freedom for over two decades, the jury finally in 2005 found Tim Hennis guilty on all counts and he was sent to death row in Leavenworth, Kansas, which is where he is to this day. Apparently, you need presidential approval for an execution, and that hasn't happened since like the 60s. So yeah, he's in Leavenworth. Now, I still have to ask, what about the hairs? What about the fingerprints? And the fingerprints. And the boot prints that were three sizes smaller than his. Was he wearing smaller shoes on purpose? Like, and the idea that somebody else was with him, like, he had three trials. The dude would have come up with some story to point fingers at somebody else eventually if that was right. the case. Like, I, I don't I don't know. Wow. So, I mean, this kid, I don't know, this kid, Pat, could he have been doing a little peeping Tom while he's walking around at night? No, he was leaving his girlfriend's house. It just literally uh, happened to be the same time be there. that it just literally happened to be the same time that Tim was leaving the Eastburn house. Which he was leaving with a trash bag, so I can only assume he was leaving after cleaning up. Of course. Yeah. Jeez. At least they finally got him. I mean, he had, what, 25 years of freedom, but... Ugh. Yeah. Good story, though. Holy smokes. Yeah, it's really sad because that whole family just really had to go through all those loops and... Ugh. He never took a plea deal. He always wanted to fight it, but... Oh, he thought he'd get off. Well, I just don't understand why none of the physical evidence matched besides the semen. Like that just is, I don't know. That's still a question for me. Question as to whose prints those were. You said he wiped the place down, probably wiped his own prints, but then he would have cleaned those other prints also if we wiped his own. So who knows? Jeez. Pretty, pretty sad. What is it with that place? You know, I was actually reading and it is like Fort Bragg is actually listed as one of the top 10 most deadly cities in the United States. I think it was even like top five. Wow. Mm -hmm. And and I don't know if it's just Fort Bragg in general. I mean, that is Fayetteville. So I don't I think Fayetteville kind of that whole area in general was pretty high on that murder board there, y'all. Hmm, that's scary. All right, should we move on? <laughs> before we do, I wanted to give a quick shout out before we move on to the paranormal. A thank you to a listener of ours, Miss Brenda. She gave us some moolah to spend on some cocktails. So this week, she did. Cocktails are going to be in honor of Miss Brenda. Thank you very much. Uh, if you would like to buy us a drink, you can do so. There's a link in the description of this episode. You can also find different links on our website. But buy us a drink. Get a shout out. Yeah. Thanks, girlfriend. Okay, mom. Lighten things up. Okay. You ready? I See guess if you so. can put this fireball in to my story. On private land at Bear Creek, North Carolina, you'll find the Devil's Tramping Ground. Oh, no. Is this just like Stoll Cemetery? Skull Cemetery? <laughs> the devil's everywhere, apparently. That's why I picked the fireball. Because the devil. Because the devil. <laughs> <laughs> well, damn, I could have picked that for mine then, too. Shoot. <laughs> I actually have two stories, and they're both about the devil. So, <laughs> Ew, mom, that's two weeks in a row. Yuck. Okay, so the Devil's Tramping Ground is an odd-looking circle, which stretches about 40 feet in diameter, so it's not small. It's pretty big. What's so odd about this area is that it is barren. According to tests run by the North Carolina Department of Agriculture, the soil is absolutely sterile. Okay, fine. But why is the sterile ground in the shape of a circle? 
And why has it been around for as long as it has? We're talking centuries. Weird. It is documented that in 1925, a 74-year-old man who was born in 1851 shared that his grandfather, so a man born in the late 1700s or early 1800s, said that the spot is exactly the same as it was when the grandfather saw it as a boy. Oh, okay. An article written in 1882 included people in their late 90s who remembered the barren space, which would date the odd area back to the 1780s. Okay, this is crazy. It is possible that settlers, even before the founding of America, were aware of the dead circle. There have been written documents mentioning the circle, and get this, it could very well date back before Columbus even set sail. (laughs) Or at least that's the written history of the mysterious circle. Now, if the indigenous people did not use written language, then it could have been there even earlier and they passed it on orally. Oh, the story of the circle. Oh my gosh. So we actually don't know how far back this circle goes. It just keeps going and going. (laughs) The Devil's Tramping Ground is so named because it is told that this is where the devil himself walks around at night, pacing up and down and around as he comes up with plans on tearing souls and causing the ruination of humans. There are, of course, other theories as to the mystery of the circle. Legend has it that this was the meeting place for Native American tribes, and the ground was made sterile for ceremonial dancing. Another legend has it that a great tribal chief was buried here, and the ground has been preserved to serve as a shrine of sorts. And then, you might have guessed this, since the ground is in a circle, big circle. (laughs) What could have made that? Like an asteroid or something? No, that would be like in the ground. Oh, Think, but close think think in the sky a star <laughs> the sun the moon what it doesn't rain there what is it what's round the world and people see it in the sky or they think they do starts with a u <laughs> what i say in my notes that yep you're right but <laughs> obviously weren't <laughs> i'm very confused what A landing spot for a UFO. Well, (sighs) move on. (laughs) Yeah. So a UFO landed there and the energy of the craft made the land barren. There have been paranormal reports as well, such as dogs howling and barking incessantly when brought to the spot. Objects left in the circle overnight disappear. And people feel nauseous and weak when they stand in the middle of the devil's tramping ground. The soil, which is markedly different from the soil outside of the circle, has been tested recently. And there were found unusual concentrations of calcium, phosphorus, cobalt, sulfur, zinc, iodine, and magnesium. This together with a high concentration of salt that was also found makes a natural salt lick or mineral lick Hmm. to which wild animals, elk, deer, moose, come to lick the important minerals. But keep in mind, now these do exist, okay, but keep in mind that natural salt licks are very, very few and far in between. So even if this is the answer to the mystery of the devil's tramping ground, it's still pretty cool to see. Like once in a lifetime thing. But that was just, I was just thinking like, regardless of the legends, that's really odd that such a large space, even after hundreds of years, is not even growing grass. Nothing. In fact, um, like locals have several times, like the garden club <laughs> has gone up there to plant, you know, and to make things grow. Just throw like some wildflower seeds out there, see what happens. Everything dies. Just doesn't grow. But I think it's odd that it's in this big circle. 
Like this perfect circle. That's what I yeah, find really odd. That is very odd. Locals were made aware of this special place through a story in the Carolinan newspaper titled, quote, Weird Tale of a Fishing Frolic, Not of a Fish Caught, But of Sight Seen. I'm sorry, what, Zach Bagans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sounds like one of his quotes. Weird Tale of a Fishing Frolic, Not of a Fish Caught, but of sight seen. Okay, that makes no sense even read the second time. This was run in 1905. Oh boy. Then in 1949, John Hardin wrote a book titled The Devil's Tramping Ground and Other North Carolina Mystery Stories. The book piqued the interest of people far outside of Chatham County. And a flood of visitors came in in search of the Devil's Tramping Ground. In 1955, directional signs marking the way to the ground were put up by the State Highway Department. Oh. <laughs> and there's this really cool picture of this lady standing beneath this tall sign. And, and they're just like, you know, highway signs. I mean, they're, right. you know, like street signs, right? right? And it's Devil's Tramping Ground. And an arrow pointing the direction she needs to go. <laughs> I'll try. If I can, I'll try to post that. It's so cool. I mean, they even named it that. That's really interesting. That's not just like a park. And no one knows No one knows where that name came from or where that legend even, because everyone's always just like what you talked about last week. Everyone has just always known it as this. So where did that even come from? Oh, it's so the weird. The Devil's Tramping Ground. I mean, these legends have to start somewhere. Somewhere, right. Uh, sad to say, you'll be hard-pressed to find even one of those signs today. They've been torn down by people. Oh, shoot, people. I'm sure. The land that the Devil's Tramping Ground is private property. And because it was trashed literally and figuratively by sightseers, you have to ask permission to visit the site. Hmm. That was a little confusing, but I think with permission, you could potentially even camp in the vicinity of the stomping ground. Just remember what you bring in, you take out. Or who knows, if the place is visited by the devil while you're there, you may take out more than you brought in. No! <laughs> All right, now let me tell you the next story. Oh, there's another one? A bonus story? Oh, awesome. North Carolinians, North Carolinians, kill, yeah, people in North Carolina <laughs> must really like legends with the devil as a character. I say that because not far from the devil's tramping ground and located on the bank of the Green River Cove near Hendersonville, North Carolina, there is the devil's track. In an enormous rock that is thousands of years old is a large left footprint pressed into the rock. The legend of how the print got there is not as well known, so let me share it with you. I found the legend on geo.io and it goes like this. The footprint is said to have been left by the devil. So where is the right footprint? Well, that's in South Carolina, of course. Is it really though? <laughs> Yes. There's a there's a right it? footprint in South Carolina? Yes. What? It's embedded in Flat Rock. That's the name of that rock. And as legend has it, hundreds of years ago, there was a man who lived in Flat Rock. Now, he was the meanest SOB one could ever meet. The man had too many vices to even start counting, and his sins were so many that if you wrote them out, the paper would stretch for miles. As happens with all of us mortals, the man came to the end of his life. He sure as heck didn't want to go to hell. I mean, who does? Which is probably where he was heading. But he also didn't want to go to heaven, which just didn't look like much fun. <laughs> he came up with a plan. He bought a handful of the sharpest tacks he could find. He climbed onto the top of Flat Rock, spread the tacks with the sharp points up, covered them with leaves, then waited. He didn't have long to wait before the devil showed up, ready to grab the old man's soul and carry it down to the fires of hell for eternity. The devil asked the man if he was ready. The man replied yes, but 
could the devil just do one little thing before the, he took his soul? The man wanted to look upon the devil's face. He pointed out that he'd been playing for the devil's team his whole life. Now he just wanted to see the face of the team's captain. You're so busy and there's so many sinful people in hell that I won't be able to see you very often. So if you could just step back a little so I could gaze upon you, I'd really appreciate it. It's really the best reward you could give me for living the life I have lived. Now, we all know the devil thinks very highly of himself. And in that respect, he's also very vain. You know, the saying flattery will get you everything. Well, I guess that works with the devil too. He straightened himself up, puffed out his chest and stepped back. He stepped down hard on those hidden tacks that the man had scattered. The devil let out a bellowing scream as he jumped in the air. When he jumped, he pushed down so hard that he left his right footprint embedded in the rock in South Carolina. He went so high that when he landed, his left foot came down so hard that he forced his left footprint into the large rock on the bank of the Green River Cove in North Carolina. The man died. But the devil was too scared of him after that trick to pull the man down. And there was no way he was going to be let past the pearly gates of heaven. So the man is destined to roam between South and North Carolina and those rocks with the devil's footprints. So at night, if you're visiting or you live in that part of the country, and if you hear a distant laugh, now you'll know who it is. That was quite <laughs> the tale. <laughs> I love these legends. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Wasn't that great, though? <laughs> How people put those two footprints together. <laughs> but where are those footprints from? I don't know, but there's a right one and a left one. <laughs> that is so weird <laughs> that you almost want to believe this story. <laughs> Sorry, I know it's not real scary, but I'm kind of happy I did this because yours was just horribly sad. So, well, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, mother. Oh, oh my okay, goodness. Okay, that's all I got for you. Alrighty. Well, that's all I got for you. <laughs> Bye, guys. Uh, thank you again to Brenda for the drink this week. Thank you. We also want to say thank you to all of our patrons. That's right. If you'd like to buy us a drink or join us on Patreon, the link is going to be in the description of this episode and on our website. We thank you very much and we'd love to give more people more shout outs. We're up on TikTok and we have our own YouTube yep. channel. We are also on Instagram and Facebook. You can follow us on all of our socials. Email us if you want us to cover a certain story or a certain legend from your state we'll do it yes photos and resources from this episode are going to be on our website killerhangoverpodcast.com <laughs> i'm seriously just thinking about these feet that is just so bizarre that there is <laughs> one in north carolina and one in south carolina in rock for thousands of years that is so weird and they're opposite feet. Yeah. That's what's... <laughs> and they legitimately look like feet? They do. They look like footprints. They're bigger than a man's footprint. <gasps> so they they're could big be footprints. like Bigfoot's footprint. What, he hops on one foot and then he hops on the other foot in well, another state? Well, <laughs> and you know what? They're bigger than people's footprints. But then like in my case, that footprint was three sizes smaller than the killer's footprint. <laughs> Too bad we're not naming our episodes like that anymore. We could just be like The Footprints in North Carolina. Yeah. Nope. Can't do it anymore. Nope. <laughs> we took away all the surprise of what we're covering by naming the episode what we are covering. But that makes it easier for listeners to find. So. Yes, Mother, you were always right. Don't forget Mother's Day is coming up in a week. So don't Sunday. forget your moms. Don't forget your moms. Have a wonderful Mother's Day. Yep. Relax. Yep. Hopefully you get to sleep in. 
Maybe somebody will cook you some breakfast. I just want to sleep in. I just want to sleep. I just want to lay in bed and just veg. Did you get that, Alex? Well, that is seriously my birthday weekend also. So you really should veg. I've got a big one this year. Yeah, you do. Big. 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 <laughs> big. Exciting. So, so we'll see what happens there. All right, my darling. I will talk at you next week. <laughs> this is a good one, Mom. Cheers, Mama. Cheers. Love you, kid. <laughs>